I want to also remind you that two weeks from today is Easter Sunday. And I want to remind you we're going to have our regular schedule of services at 8.30, 9.50, and 11.10. And at each of those services, we are planning on providing overflow seating in the chapel for all, if, if it's needed. Um, this group, I'm glad you're here at 8.30, glad you come at 8.30. I hope you can come at 8.30 on Easter as well, because our 9.50 and 11.10 services have been absolutely pretty much maxed out. And so it's going to be really crowded on Easter Sunday morning in those two. So if you can make the 8.30 like you typically do, that would be greatly appreciated. So uh, be inviting people for Easter, and let's pack out the 8.30 service as well. That would be great to have. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John 15 this morning. As Herb mentioned, we're continuing this sermon series, I Am, and today's is I Am the True Vine. Bob and Joe Liggett are the happy winners of the largest pumpkin at last year's Circleville Pumpkin Show. Their entry weighed in at 1,837 and a half pounds. 1,837 and a half pounds. That is a lot of pumpkin pie. The process, though, of growing such a large pumpkin takes a lot of care. I read this past week that some of these extremely large pumpkins can grow up to 40 pounds in one day. But there is so much time and effort and a ton of water and proper sunlight for that to occur. But in that process, there's also pruning. Most of the leaves, most of the branches are pruned so that the life-giving sap can be directed specifically toward the growth of the one pumpkin rather than a bunch of smaller pumpkins. The source of the sap is in the vine, so it's important that the connection with the pumpkin is never disrupted. The vine cannot dry rot, it cannot crack, it cannot bend, it cannot connect in any way. The strength of that pumpkin is directly proportionate to the strength of the connection to the vine. Well, we're looking today at another one of Jesus' I am statements in the Gospel of John, and it is, I am the true vine. Jesus uses this agricultural analogy. In all of the I am statements Jesus made, they reveal something about Jesus' identity, including this one. But this I am statement, we learn something more about our relationship with the Lord. So I want to talk today about even if you might be struggling in your walk with the Lord right now, I hope this will be a huge encouragement to you because it's so easy to get ourselves distracted from what God wants and desires over what we sometimes want. God wants us to have the best possible life on this earth with His Son as our Savior and our Lord. And the Heavenly Father is not out to discard us or doom us or direct us to a life that is futile. He desires that we stay connected to Him and that lives, our lives, bear fruit for Him. Now, I am not much of a gardener. I do not have a green thumb. I wish I did. You give me a plant, I'll kill it in a day. <laughs> but you don't want to give me stuff like that. It's just not my forte. When I started reading this passage in John chapter 15, I immediately thought of one of our members who died back in 2007, Don Hutchison. Don Hutchison always had the most beautiful, pristine garden I've ever seen. Now, I always loved late July and early August when Don was around because that meant for our family fresh green beans, beautiful cucumbers, delicious homegrown tomatoes. He would supply us with those and even some more vegetables for the next several weeks. In fact, one year I had to tell Don not to bring any more tomatoes because I was eating so many of them every day that my mouth was breaking out due to the high acidic content. But I know this, Don worked hard at his gardening. He prepared the ground every spring. He prepared it every fall. He meticulously plotted out where he would plant each item. He never allowed weeds to overtake his garden. I think weeds were afraid of him because he was so meticulous. It was just a daily effort he gave in pruning and supplying what was needed for growing. So I want us to see this passage in John 15, what Jesus is teaching and how it applies to our continuing to grow in our daily relationship with the Lord. Let's look at John 15, beginning at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus and his disciples had just left the upper room where he had had the last supper with them. As they went from the upper room toward the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus would soon be arrested, they would have walked a path to the Mount of Olives, and on the way, they would have passed the temple. One of the ornaments on the temple would have been a great golden vine with a large cluster of grapes about as large as a person. And that ornament, that cluster of grapes, was symbolic of what the spies found when they entered Canaan, the promised land. And when the spies reported back to Moses, they described how large the grapes were, and they even brought back a cluster of grapes on a branch that had to be carried by two men. Two men, by the way, from Spain are credited with the largest cluster of grapes ever grown. According to the Guinness World Records, the cluster weighed 22.3 pounds, and it was verified on August the 4th, 2018. 22.3 pounds in that one cluster. Jesus would have noticed the grapes, that ornament of grapes on the temple, and he used it as a basis for what really is a parable that he is sharing here. And so this agricultural analogy is meant to illustrate a spiritual truth to the disciples. Uh, the cultivation of grapes, by the way, is called viticulture, is one of the common features of Palestinian life. The disciples would have been very familiar with viticulture. Uh, a preacher friend of mine used this chart to show the relationship of the vine, the gardener, and the branches, and it is in your bulletin as well. You have there the vine. It brings sap from the root to give life to the branches. It's intended to represent Jesus Christ. It sustains life to the disciples. There's the gardener. He prunes the unwanted branches. He hauls away. He burns the rubbish. That's intended to represent God the Father. He's the one who judges and cleanses the community. And then there's the branches themselves. Their function is to bear fruit. And that is intended to represent Jesus' disciples and us. We're to carry on the ministry of Jesus by demonstrating his love. Now, Jesus was not giving a lesson in farming to his disciples. They already knew about agriculture. Instead, Jesus is using the vine to describe his function. His function is to give life to the branches. And so the vine gives life to the branches to help them produce fruit. So when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he is saying he's going to give to us sustaining life as long as we're connected to him and that we as healthy branches should produce fruit. So Jesus is the vine, God is the gardener. Preacher Rob Fuquay in his book, The God We Know, tells about talking with one of his church members and telling him about the garden he had planted. The church member stopped by one day and he noticed the tomato plants had been planted and he started to pinch off some of those growth stalks. And the preacher was watching from inside his house briefly and he went outside and he said, what are you doing? And I loved what the member said, uh, the member said to the preacher, preacher, don't forget to pinch the suckers. Boy, that's good advice for preachers. Don't forget to pinch the suckers. And he then pointed to those growth stalks between the branches and the vine. He said, if you don't pinch off these shoots, they will sap energy from the vine and lessen the quality of the tomatoes. So pinch your suckers, preacher. You know what that tells me? We each have some suckers in our lives that sometimes appear they keep us from being as fruitful as we could be for Christ. We, we might start to get some unproductive branches that sap our spiritual walk with God, and they sap the energy from us. They, sap, they take the sap away from us. Regrets, resentment, bitterness, envy. But when we're focusing on our connection to Christ, we don't have time to nurse those little offshoots that are so unproductive. Mike Iaconelli in his book, Spiritual, or excuse me, Messy Spirituality, tells the story of Margaret. Margaret was a woman who lived nearly 40 years trying to overcome the pain of what happened to her as a little girl. She grew up attending a one-room schoolhouse, and from the very first day, she collided with a demanding and difficult teacher, Miss Garner. Their relationship spiraled downward until one day it came completely crashing down. Margaret had arrived late one day to class, and Miss Garner instructed the students to come up to the chalkboard one by one and write something bad about Margaret. 
And so each student in that one-room schoolhouse filed forward, and they wrote something on the chalkboard bad about Margaret. Margaret is stupid. Margaret is selfish. Margaret is fat. The pain of what happened to her on that day never left her. Forty years later, she was still trying to rid herself of the wound she had suffered on that day. And for almost two years in weekly therapy, Margaret tried to cut away the memories of that horrible day. And through many tears and much pain, she recounted every name of every student and every statement they wrote. When she finished crying, the counselor informed her that she had forgotten one person. And Margaret sat there saying, well, I don't remember any other. I thought I had remembered every student and every statement that was written. And the counselor said, no, Margaret, you did forget someone. He is sitting in the back of the classroom. He is standing up. He is walking towards your teacher, Miss Garner. She is handing him a piece of chalk, and he's taking it. Watch, Margaret. He is erasing every one of those sentences the students wrote. Those are gone. Margaret, he's looking at you now. Do you recognize him yet? His name is Jesus. Look, he's writing new sentences on the board. Margaret is loved. Margaret is beautiful. Margaret is gentle and kind. Margaret is strong. Margaret has great courage. Maybe somebody here today needs to be reminded that God the great gardener has the ability to remove your past hurts if you're connected to the true vine Jesus Christ. Now, there are some principles for us today where Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And this is for us as the branches. Here's the first one. Healthy branches stay connected to the vine. Healthy branches stay connected to the vine. Look at verses 4 and 5. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Maybe you've gone out in your yard after a significant storm has passed through, or maybe when the wind was blowing 60 miles an hour yesterday, and you had to pick up all kinds of branches that were lying on the ground. Those branches are not going to green up anymore. And if they were from a fruit tree, they're no longer going to produce any fruit. Why? Because the connection's gone. Jesus said three times in the first few verses of John 15, you remain in me, you remain in the vine, you remain in my love. And that word remain is our part. It's our responsibility. If you grew up weaned on the King James Version of the Bible, it's the word abide. You abide in me. And that implication is an enduring personal relationship. There's an example of that in marriage. After the wedding ceremony, if the couple doesn't regularly connect emotionally, physically, and spiritually, the marriage will eventually die. Now, the legal status might remain, but the essence of the whole relationship has disappeared. Because being a Christian is not just believing and repenting and confessing and being baptized into Christ. I had an old preacher friend years ago that said there should be a sign in every baptistry that reads, don't stop here. We have to work at staying connected to the vine. Why? Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. About everybody in today's world, in our modern world, has a cell phone today. And if your cell phone is nothing more than an expensive paperweight, if it does not have a power source. And a branch does everything it can to stay connected to the vine. In his book, Not a Fan, Kyle Eidelman tells a story of speaking at an event, and a man came up to him afterward and began telling him the story of his prodigal daughter. She went to college. She totally abandoned her faith. Eidelman writes, as soon as he started the story, I knew how it would go. I've heard it so many times, even the details seem predictable. But when he finished, he didn't ask me why she was doing this or what had gone wrong. He wasn't looking for an explanation. Instead, with one sentence, he put his finger on what he thought had happened. We raised her in church, but we didn't raise her in Christ. Maybe you walked into this worship service this morning, but you might not really be walking with Jesus Christ. You're not remaining in Him. You're not abiding in Him. Maybe you can look spiritual. You can sound spiritual. You sang the songs. You even gave money towards debt reduction. But all you're really doing is going through the motions. 
In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about cheap grace. In essence, he said, the church teaches very often that there's nothing we can do to earn God's love, and there's nothing we can do to keep God from stopping to love us. We preach the good news of grace, and when we hear the message, it gets twisted like a branch. He wrote, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. We like the idea of God's grace being our forgiveness, and we like staying only there, forgetting we have a part to play because healthy branches do everything they can to stay connected to the vine. Jesus said, you remain in me, you abide in me. Here's another principle. Healthy branches bear good fruit. Healthy branches bear good fruit. Verse 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's say you're driving one day up 310 up towards Morse Road. You get up there by Lynn's Fruit Farm, and it's in the fall, and you just happen to look over where you've normally seen in the past falls those beautiful apple trees. But suddenly you stop because you don't see apples, but you see oranges and bananas growing from the trees. How do you know what kind of tree it is? By its fruit. And if you're staying connected to Jesus as the vine, you're going to produce some fruit. Now, the Bible talks about four different kinds of fruit that I could find this past week that the believer ought to produce. Number one, there is character fruit. Character fruit. This is who you are or it's who you can become in Jesus Christ. It's evidence that the Holy Spirit lives within us and that somehow we are connected to Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So there is character fruit. Then there is service fruit. Sometimes it's called good works. James 2 says, our faith should produce good works. We're not saved by good works, but we are saved to do good works. And so a life that is connected to Jesus Christ is going to have an overflow of good works come out of it. Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. In other words, the fruit you bear is going to be some service for the kingdom. And then there's praise fruit. Hebrews 13, 15, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips openly profess his name. Now, if your lips are using God's name in vain or using words of profanity, that is not the fruit of being connected to Jesus Christ. Every once in a while, see on social media posts that do not reflect that some Christians are bearing the fruit of Christ in their lives because of words they use. One of the obvious ways you can give praise to God is through your participation in worship with singing. The praise of our lips is part of our fruit. And then there is people fruit, the fourth kind. There is people fruit. Notice I did not say fruity people, although there are some of those. People fruit is when another person becomes a follower of Christ. Colossians 1, 6, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit. And growing throughout the whole world, just as it had been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Now, those who truly understand the grace of God they've received, they want that grace to be shared over and over again. They want that grace reproduced, just like a seed produces fruit. Ezekiel 15 in the Old Testament, it talks about the branches of a vine. And it says branches are only good for two purposes, fruit or fuel, bearing fruit or fuel being burned. And part of having a plentiful harvest is learning the painful process of pruning. Bruce Wilkinson in his book, Secrets of the Vine, writes, God's strategy for coaxing a greater harvest out of his branches is not the one you and I'd prefer. His plan is to prune, which means to thin, reduce, cut off. As unthinkable as it sounds, as contradictory as it is, the vine dresser's secret for more is less. His purpose for you to cut away immature commitments and lesser priorities is to make room for an even greater abundance for His glory. 
So Wilkinson says, you, sometimes we overcommit ourselves and we forget about the most important commitment in our life. And sometimes we say Jesus Christ is really our priority, but we're not really living that way. And God doesn't want our lives spent in the weeds all the time. He wants us to learn to get rid of some of those weeds so our lives can be more productive. What weed in your life right now is there that needs pulled? You have some attitudes or actions that are becoming stumbling blocks or they're becoming traps or they're at least certainly a significant temptation. Is there jealousy or anger or selfishness, pride, envy, greed that's overgrowing the fruit that God wants you to have? Or are there even some people in your life from whom you need to walk away from spiritually? You need to pull the connection away from them and focus it more on Christ. And they take you away, those people take you away from the fruitful harvest, and, and they pull you into a land that is barren spiritually. But what you need more than anything else really is that connection to Jesus Christ. Proverbs 24, verses 30 and 31 read, I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. It was a person that Solomon's talking about that they just allowed all the weeds to take over. They didn't really focus on the harvest and the production of the fruit. Several years ago, Barb Adam and I were in California, and we went to Napa Valley to see the tremendous vineyards. Anybody been up to Napa Valley? Okay, I had a couple people been up there. It is beautiful up there. Uh, it is gorgeous, except for obviously when they're in drought. But most of those grapes are for winemaking. But the growers will not reap the benefit of their harvest for several years. In fact, we were taking a tour of one of the vineyards, and the tour guide was telling us that the break-even point for the investment usually takes 15 to 18 years. That means there has to be a long-term commitment to producing fruit that's going to eventually provide a harvest. There's no room for anybody in that kind of produce in the vineyard growing for the grapes. There's no room for somebody that's going to quit early. It's got to be somebody that's going to stay on top of it day after day after day after day. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here when he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. You are the branches. We have to stay connected to him day after day after day. We have to work on bearing fruit from our lives. And by clinging to him, we will eventually bear fruit. Now, it's not automatic but it's inevitable. So are you attached to the true vine? Is Jesus Christ your source of hope? Is he the most important priority to which you're being connected today? You didn't just come to church to get up and be here just out of habit, although it's a good habit. Are you connecting yourselves every day to Jesus Christ? If you need to make that connection with Christ, when we dismiss after our time of worship and communion this morning, you can meet with me right up here near the baptistry area, and we'll talk to you about what it means about believing and confessing and repenting of sins and being baptized into Christ. But as I mentioned, don't stop there. It takes your abiding in Christ to produce fruit every single day. And if you've already accepted Christ, been baptized into him, you'd like to bring your membership here to our church, I'll be up here in the front as well. You come to the front, and we can talk about what you need to do. Now, one of the ways we stay connected as branches to the true vine is when we observe the Lord's Supper or communion. Our text today is from John 15, but I want you to remember this whole scenario started back in John chapter 13 at the Last Supper. And during the celebration of the Passover, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, and he called it the fruit of the vine. This Eucharistic celebration, and Eucharist is just a fancy word for thanksgiving. This Eucharistic celebration is a celebration of thanksgiving. It's one of the most meaningful ways that believers can commemorate and consecrate their being connected to the vine. So we're going to observe communion here in just a moment and just in a little bit of a different manner. I'm going to pray and then you're going to have about a minute or so. There's going to be some meditative music. And during that time, you can partake on your own. 
As you reflect on what Jesus was willing to do for you, ask yourself this question, how am I staying connected to him? Because I believe he is the vine and I'm one of the branches. How am I staying connected to him? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we take a few moments to meditate and think about what Jesus should mean to each and every one of us, may we get rid of some of those things in our lives that crowd Him out. God, may we make our focus and our priority being connected to Him, being connected to the vine. God, whatever there is in our lives, whatever weeds there might be, would you help us remove those? And would you help us to cultivate the fruit that can come from our lives? I know we each probably have some temptations ahead of us today, the, some struggles where sometimes we aren't the best fruit producers. But God, would you help us to make changes in those areas where we need to grow? Where we really need to allow Christ to begin to make more of a difference in our lives? And Lord, when we stand before you, may we remember that promise of hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. May that be said of us because we have the fruit of serving. We, we have the fruit of loving. We, we have the fruit of character. Not because we've done something beautiful, but because you've done something beautiful. By taking our lives and producing fruit from them, that brings glory to you. May we take a few moments to look upon the cross and see what Jesus was willing to do. In his name we pray, amen.